Hey, everyone. Oh, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, OK, so um, thanks, Andy. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, as Andy said, I'm a second year grad student at the AMP Lab. Um, and, uh, and I'll be telling you about GraphX, which is, uh, which is our library for graph computation on Spark, um, for, for large-scale graph computation. And uh, GraphX actually started as a research project uh, that aimed to unify uh, graph, graph and data parallel systems. Uh, and now it's become a stable part of Spark since December. OK, so the, the reason why we were interested in graphs in the first place uh, is that they're, they're actually surprisingly common. Um, many kinds of data can be viewed as graphs, even if they aren't stored that way. So th there are some easy examples of graphs. Uh, for instance, there's social networks, where users are vertices, and social relationships like friendship and following uh, are edges. Um, but uh, And these kinds of graphs aren't just limited to the relationship graph. There's also uh, posts and photos that can be part of the graph um, as vertices. Uh, and even actions such as liking can, can be part of the graph. And Facebook stores their graph this way. Another common example of graphs is the web. So pages connect to each other using hyperlinks. Uh, but some graphs are less obvious. Uh, for instance, when users rate products on Amazon and Netflix, um, that creates this bipartite graph uh, where users and products are, are vertices and ratings are edges. And so I'll, I'll show how collaborative filtering algorithms like uh, alternating least squares, ALS, uh, can be seen as operations on this graph. Uh, now, there are a number of graph algorithms, uh, and they all have something important in, in common, as, as I'll show. Uh, first, there's page rank. So th this finds the most important pages in a graph, as Vida showed. Um, and uh, it uses links as a, as a vote of importance. Uh, and a vote counts for more if it's coming from an important page. Uh, and then this algorithm works by repeatedly uh, sending votes along links and then increasing the rank of pages that get more votes. Another algorithm is triangle counting, which measures the co cohesiveness of, of communities. Um, so here, there are these three triangles. Uh, and the person in the, in the center is part of all three triangles, which means that in a certain sense, uh, his, his friends tend to know each other, and so it's sort of a strong community. But then, as I promised, one of the obvious algorithms is uh, alternating these squares for collaborative filtering. Uh, that's actually a graph algorithm, uh, and it aims to infer uh, what kinds of users like what kinds of products, and then make recommendations on the basis of those, of those inferences. So when a user rates a product, uh, it, it says something about both the, the user's feature vector, which is what the user is interested in, as well as the product's feature uh, vector, which is what, what interest the product appeals to. Uh, and you probably think of this as a low-rank matrix factorization problem, where you have this sparse ratings matrix, the red one, uh, and you want to fill it in with predicted ratings based on just a few existing actual ratings. And then to do that, you assume that it can be expressed as a product of uh, low-rank matrices, where each row and column is a feature. And so those are the user and product feature uh, matrices. But this, this, uh, this iterative algorithm to, to estimate that factorization is to alternate, uh, alternate between optimizing the user factors to match the observed ratings uh, while keeping the movie factors fixed and vice versa. And you can view this as an algorithm on a bipartite graph, where we connect the user and movie factors by, rate, uh, by the ratings and then update each user factor or product factor by min uh, minimizing the prediction error for all adjacent ratings using least squares. And the, uh, the uh, algorithm in, in MLlib that, that actually does this uh, was written before GraphX was released, so it doesn't directly use GraphX, but it, it incorporates graph computation techniques that come from the early versions of GraphX. So that, 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 that sort of demonstrates that viewing this, this problem as a graph, as a graph problem uh, makes it possible to apply some specialized optimizations that, uh, that can make this much faster. So it turns out that all of these graph algorithms can be expressed using the same pattern of computation, which is the following. To calculate the value for a particular vertex, so something like the rank, uh, the number of triangles passing it through it, or the, the feature for that vertex, um, you only need to access the neighboring vertices and edges. Uh, now, these algorithms may do this multiple times, but in each iteration, only that vertices, vertex's neighborhood is accessed. Uh, what this means is that these algorithms can be expressed as independent operations on each vertex and its neighbors. And that allows uh, these algorithms to run in parallel and scale to large graphs. So in addition to those three algorithms, this pattern of parallelism captures a variety of algorithms from machine learning, data mining, and graph analysis. Uh, and so the goal of GraphX is to allow the user to express this pattern. But there are two challenges. Uh, the first challenge is high degree vertices. Now, real world graphs has many, ha have many instances of these. So for example, Taylor Swift has, uh, I think it's now 54 million followers on Twitter. Um, and uh, GraphX, if it wants to operate on this kind of a graph, it has to store the graph carefully to handle these kinds of vertices. So uh, for example, if you store the graph using adjacency lists, 
um, that won't work because uh, the, the edges adjacent to a single vertex may not even fit on one machine. So that's the that's storage challenge. And also, uh, GraphX has to be careful with the API because even a single vertex neighborhood might be too big to iterate over. And so you, you have to somehow break up, the, uh, break up the graph into parallel units that are smaller than one, than one vertex neighborhood. The second challenge is that real graph analysis involves more than just running graph algorithms. It involves a complex pipeline of tasks. So, so to reuse the Wikipedia example uh, that Vita uh, provided, uh, if, you, if you want to analyze Wikipedia from, rather than by, by scraping it from, a, from an existing XML dump, then you could, uh, you, could, you could take that XML and parse it into a, maybe a table of the articles and their links. Uh, and then from there, you could extract a link graph and then maybe run page rank to see uh, how important each page is and get a list of top 20 articles. So that's one, that's one pipeline that you could, you could do. You could also parse this differently. Uh, you could look at who edits each article uh, and then extract a table of, edit, of, uh, of uh, uh, the editor corresponding to the article they edited and from there, from there get a graph of who edits the same articles. Uh, then you could, you could use something like triangle count or label propagation to find communities of editors. Uh, and finally, you could get a table of uh, what community each user is in. Also, uh, these kinds of uh, analytics pipelines might actually join together two different kinds of graphs. Uh, so here, we, we might take the uh, top pages and the top communities and join them together to find the most influential communities on Wikipedia. So uh, notice that these pipelines involve viewing the same data, which is this Wikipedia base data, as both tables and graphs. So, uh, so there, the, the, that's the second challenge. And for, for this, our solution, uh, which we pro proposed in, in the paper, that was a research solution, uh, was to embed this graph processing um, problem within a table-oriented system like Spark. And then that, that, that brings up its, its own challenges, um, which are how, how, how do you actually represent graphs in a table system? Um, how do you express these graph operations, these, uh, these algorithms, as this, this uh, sort of Spark standard operators? Uh, and also, how do you, how do you present these, uh, these views in a coherent way to the user? So GraphX um, was built to solve these challenges. Um, so it, it aims to let you express graph computation easily and support uh, all kinds of graphs efficiently. And finally, it integrates into larger Spark-based pipelines. So first, I'll talk about how, uh, how it looks to use it, uh, the API. And then in the next section, I'll talk about how it works. So first of all, uh, GraphX models graphs using an idea called the property graph. Um, here, in, uh, so in addition to the graph structure, each vertex can have a property, um, something like the current page rank value or something more complex like a user's profile if you're on Facebook. Um, and each edge can also have a property, so something like the edge weight, um, the relationship type, or a timestamp when the edge was added. So with that, let's see how to create a graph using the GraphX API. We'll, we'll make a social graph uh, where, where uh, with people and relationships between them, um, and each person needs a unique ID. So GraphX gives us a type alias for this. Uh, and the first step is to give uh, each, each vertex a property, um, a name in this case. So we have uh, an RDD here of, uh, uh, with, with three people in it, uh, which are just pairs of vertex ID and, the, and their, their name. Uh, so vertex one is Alice and so on. And, uh, and then we... Um, uh, want to create edges, um, which are the, the relationships between people in this toy graph. Um, so GraphX gives us this edge class, um, and we can use it to create an RDD of edges. Uh, and so here we have, we connect vertices one and two by this coworker relationship, and two and three by a friend. And, um, and uh, finally, then we, we need to wrap the whole, um, the, uh, these two RDDs into a graph using the graph constructor. And that's the line at the bottom there. And this is what, um, what uh, lets us start actually uh, operating on, on this as a graph rather than as just two unconnected RDDs. Uh, so here's what you can do with a graph. We, we can uh, get back um, the, the data that we put in as, as vertices, in a, uh, vertices and edges, uh, just RDDs. Um, but also we can get back an augmented version of the edges called the triplets, which are the edges along with their adjacent vertex properties. Um, so I'll show an example of that later. Um, also, there, there are some standard transformations that are familiar from Spark. So we can, uh, we can do things like mapping each of the vertex and edge properties uh, and reversing all the edges. Uh, we can also filter the graph using a vertex or edge predicate or both. We can do some joins. We can, so we can, we can sort of generally join in external data, external tables uh, into the graph, and this is also very useful. Um, and, uh, and we can, finally, the, the most important primitive in a certain sense is that we can send messages along edges. Uh, and, and that's what aggregated messages lets you do. Um, so it, 
it, it, it, uh, this primitive captures the neighborhood computation pattern that I mentioned, which is the key to most graph algorithms. So th those are primitives, but we also have some built-in algorithms that you can call on a graph. Uh, for example, there's page rank, uh, there's triangle count, as I mentioned, and also there's a, an a algorithm called connected components, which identifies these independent disconnected pieces of the graph. Um, and there, there's several more in the graphx.lib package. So I, I want to go into detail on three of the more interesting uh, graph primitives um, because they're, they're instructive for, for, how, uh, for the core of how graphx works. Uh, so the first one is triplets, which, as I mentioned, gives you the edges along with their adjacent vertex properties. Uh, and so graphx packages the, this, uh, this data type into this edge triplet class. Uh, and uh, so it contains uh, first the same things as, the, as an edge, so the source and destination vertex ID and uh, the edge attribute, but also it contains the corresponding vertex properties. So notice the difference between the, the vertex ID and the vertex property. So the ID is just, is just a small number. The property can be arbitrarily large. And so this involves some communication that, that, I'll, that I'll talk about later. Um, so, uh, and here, here's what, the, what this looks like if we call it on the toy graph that we built. There's the graph, and if we call triplets, then we get back this table. Really, it, it should actually have uh, five columns, but uh, I've omitted the uh, source and destination ID because they aren't very interested, uh, very interesting. But this shows the um, it, it shows that the source you know it, 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 this table encodes things like uh, the vertex with property Alice is coworker of vertex with property Bob. The second operation that I'll talk about is subgraph, uh, which filters the graph according to an edge predicate or a vertex predicate. Um, so for this, to, to, to see how this works, we'll use a more interesting version of the, of the graph from earlier that has one extra person, David, uh, and also some extra, uh, so some new uh, edge types, so relative, uh, Alice is Charlie's relative, and Charlie is David's relative. So, um, uh, and, and also to say it's based on the slide, I've stopped showing the vertex ID again, uh, only the property, the name. Uh, but so first, let's, let's give some graph an edge predicate. Um, so here, we'll, we'll filter out the relative relationships, and. Uh, this is what, the, what we get back. As you'd expect, you, the, uh, the edges that had relative are, are gone. David is still there, though, because uh, he's, he's, even though he isn't involved in any, any relationships, um, the, we, we haven't actually said to filter out the, that relevant vertex, so it hasn't been filtered. But uh, now we can also give subgraph a, a vertex predicate, so um, we, can, we can filter out Bob, for example, from the graph. And, uh, now, now here, Bob is gone, and also the edges involving Bob are gone. So GraphX always ensures that a graph is valid, meaning that there are no dangling edges. Also, in, in case you're uh, interested in subgraph, it's actually implemented in, in sort of a slightly clever way that, uh, that makes it very efficient for, uh, for uh, sort of less selective predicates. Uh, it it, it use, uses tombstone, tomb, tombstoning, which is sort of just an array of, of bits um, that goes alongside each vertex and edge. And, uh, and so that, that, that actually has some benefits, not only in, in making the uh, filtering fast, but also uh, it means that, that once you filter a graph, um, you can actually join it very efficiently back with the original graph. And that's a pattern that is used commonly in, uh, in some of the GraphX algorithms. Uh, so the last operation I'll talk about is aggregate messages. So uh, this enables GraphX, as I said, to express those graph, comp graph algorithms. Um, and it takes these two user-defined functions, send message and merge message. So, uh, the first one, uh, send message, has the opportunity to send messages along edges, uh, and it gets this edge context, which is which contains a triplet, and also the um, the so contains a triplet, uh, which is the the edge along with its source and destination uh, vertex uh, vertex properties, uh, and and it's able to uh, to send um, messages in both directions, and then the second uh, function combines messages that are destined to the same vertex. Uh, and then finally, this operation returns uh, an RDD that contains a con combined messages, uh, one combined message for every vertex that received a message. So first of all, uh, as I mentioned, edge context, this is what it looks like. It, it has the, the same stuff as a triplet, but it also has these, uh, these methods that you can call uh, sort of imperatively, um, which let you send messages in both directions. Uh, and so here's what it looks like to use that. Um, we, we can use it to find the degree of, uh, of a, uh, uh, of each vertex in a graph, for example. That's kind of the simplest thing you can do with this. Um, and uh, so that's just the total number of, of uh, edges that go in or out of each vertex. So here, to, to, to do this for each edge, we want to send a one in both directions, so to both the source and destination, and then we want to add up the ones that each, uh, that each vertex receives, and that gives us the degree. 
Uh, and then here, here's what it looks like to run. Um, so if we run it on, the, on that bigger graph earlier, then we get back a table that says, uh, say, for example, Alice is involved in two relationships and uh, Charlie is in three. So now I'll show something more interesting, which is how a real algorithm is, is expressed using these GraphX primitives. Um, so this algorithm is, some, is, is, a, is a particularly cool one, I think, because it's, it's something that, that actually can't be expressed in the, uh, the, the classic um, specialized graph systems like GraphLab or Giraffe. Uh, and the reason is that it, it, uh, it involves mixing both tables and graphs in the same algorithm. So this is graph coarsening, that's the algorithm, uh, which finds clusters of related vertices and then collapses each cluster into a single vertex while preserving the edges between clusters. Uh, so for example, on a, on a web graph uh, where we have, um, we have uh, uh, pages and links between them, this could extra extract a domain graph that has the domains and the links between them. And this kind of sort of super node collapsing is, is actually a pretty common thing in, uh, in uh, like CS theory. Uh, so it's, it's useful. Um, and uh, so to, to do this, we could start with uh, that web graph, as I mentioned. And the first thing we could do is maybe take, take a subgraph to um, w call subgraph with an edge predicate to, to get a graph of links within the same domain. Uh, and then we could take this and, and use a built-in connected components algorithm to, uh, to, to kind of label each page with its domain, which is shown here as the color. Uh, and then, we, then we, could, uh, we could actually use Spark's built-in grouping operator um, on, not on the graph, but on the RDD of, uh, of vertices uh, to, 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 get, uh, to get a unique set of domains. And then finally, we can join this using the graph constructor back with uh, the original web graph uh, to get a, uh, a new graph that has the domains as vertices, but also the original edges. And so that's, that's the domain graph. Okay, so that was how to, how to use GraphX uh, from the API point of view. Now I'll tell you a bit about how Graph GraphX works underneath. So the first question is, um, how do we represent graphs as, uh, uh, as tables within Spark? Uh, so we just use the first thing that maybe comes to mind, which is to store the vertices and the properties in, uh, in one table and then the edges and the properties in, the, in a, a different table. So this is actually a good idea for two reasons. Um, oh, here, here's the edge table. So uh, this is useful because, um, so first of all, it, it, it sort of seamlessly solves the problem of high degree vertices because uh, now we can split up the, the edges of, uh, of, say, Taylor Swift um, across machines without regard for uh, whether they're, you know, they're all connected to Taylor Swift or not. Um, so, so here, for example, um, th there's a, the vertex A that has four edges, and those edges are split across those two partitions. So there's two in each partition, A, B, A, C, and then A, E, A, F. Uh, and secondly, the good thing um, about this is that it gives us free, complete freedom in partitioning the graph to minimize communication. So all we have to do is just store the edges in a different order, uh, and that, that sort of partitions the graph in any arbitrary way. So now we can see how, how to implement the graph operations from before. Uh, so first of all, memory, uh, many of these operations reuse uh, some part of the graph, like either the, either the vertices or the edges. So map vertices reuses the, uh, the edges, map edges the vertices, and, uh, and, and so on. And so since we stored the vertices separate from, uh, separately from the edges, we can easily change the vertices while reusing the edges. So for example, if, if we just transform the vertices, then we can, uh, we can just reuse the edges. And so that, that, that again also, also, also makes it uh, fast to implement some of the join operators. Um, okay, so, uh, but now the problem is that uh, some of the operations, two of them particularly, uh, involve extra work because of the way that we stored the graph. So triplets is the, is the easiest one to, to explain. So uh, to get the triplets, each edge, need, each edge needs access to its adjacent vertex properties. Um, and this is essentially, it's a three-way join of the, of the edges with the vertices on both sides. And to do this, we could use a broadcast join uh, where we send each vertex property to, to all, the, uh, all the edge partitions. Um, but that'd be a lot of communication. So instead, we, we want to send the vertex properties, each vertex property, to only to the edge partitions where it's referenced. Uh, so for example, A should be sent to both partitions because it's referenced by edges on both. Uh, but, but B should only be sent to the first partition, since, partition, since there's no edge referencing B uh, in, in the second, part, sec, second edge partition. Um, so we do this by storing an extra index uh, called the routing table. Oh, that's, that's a join that we want. So yeah, the routing table. Um, this tells us that A uh, should go to both partitions and B should go to the first partition. Um, and then we can use this. Uh, oh, I, I actually, then, well, so th this makes that, that join easy. Uh, but then also, many algorithms change just a few of the vertex properties in each iteration. So we added some special handling uh, in triplets for this case by storing the relevant vertex properties in a cache of the edge partitions. Uh, so that way, only, so when a, only a few vertex properties change, we can only send those uh, rather than resending them all. 
so here's what, uh, here's the benefit of that. So uh, for, for some algorithms, this re uh, results in a large drop in communication and runtime in later iterations. So for example, in connected components, um, the, the property of, of this algorithm is that as, a, as it starts to converge, um, most vertices uh, have, have sort of already received their final value, and only a few are still changing. And so you can actually see this in, in the graph of, of communication, which I just got from the Spark UI. Um, so, so here, for example, the number of vertex attributes uh, that uh, is moving across the network uh, drops by five orders of magnitude after eight, eight iterations. Now, um, aggregated messages uh, works by scanning the triplets on each edge partition uh, and then running the send message function uh, for each of those triplets, and then finally aggregating the messages to get the result. Uh, and we also have another optimization uh, here that automatically chooses whether to scan the edges and probe the vertex cache or to do, do the opposite, which is to scan the vertices and then probe the edges. And, uh, and that has another um, big benefit, which is uh, for some algorithms uh, where, again, we, uh, we sort of end up only, only needing to access a few of the edges, it saves us from having to look at all of them, which in, in, in this case can be a, a speed up of, or you know, arbitrarily uh, large speed up. Uh, and so here, in, this, in this, uh, this actual experiment, we get a pretty good drop in runtime for each iteration. So the result of all, all, this, all this work, uh, to sum up, is that uh, graphics is comparable in performance to specialized graph systems, but unlike these systems, it can express a wider range of algorithms, um, so like, uh, like graph coarsening. Uh, so there, there's a comparable, um, you, you can see the graphics is sort of, it's in some cases faster, in some cases slower uh, by just a bit. Um, but the important point then is that uh, it's, it's more flexible than, the, than those systems, but also is, uh, it's much faster than writing an algorithm na naively in Spark. So here it's an order of magnitude difference. Uh, now, as of the, the, the Spark 1.2 release in December, uh, GraphX is no longer an alpha component. It's a stable component, which means that the API uh, is stable and future changes are, will be backwards compatible, are guaranteed to be backwards compatible. Um, so finally, I'll, I'll just give you a preview of what's next uh, for GraphX. So there, there, there's the Java and Python APIs that are coming out. Currently, it's only supported in Scala. Um, also, there are some, some new machine learning algorithms that are coming in. Uh, that, and these will, will generally go into, into MLlib, but will use GraphX underneath. Um, and finally, we're doing some research. Uh, that's what I'm working on currently. So um, we're exploring a new API for, for graph processing that exposes these distributed graphs as a collection of local graphs. And the uh, idea here is to allow the user to apply specialized operations like, uh, like blast routines uh, to get much higher performance. We're also uh, looking at uh, algorithms on time-varying graphs. So these are, these are common in real life, of course. Almost all graphs are changing. Twitter, for example, is changing each time you follow uh, a user. Um, but no distributed framework actually supports this kind of time-varying graph efficiently. Um, so th there, there's, some, there's some work on that. I, um, I'm, I'm actually, I'll, I'll mention the, the first steps that, I've, uh, the, that we've uh, finished towards this. And finally, um, there's, uh, uh, it's in, it, it would be nice to work on secondary indexing that, that supports querying for patterns in graphs. Um, so f for example, if you, if you wanted to find a, a loop with four edges, oh sorry, with four vertices in, in the loop, then that, that kind of a pattern uh, if you build the right indexing, can, can become fast. And that would bring together the, the sort of these graph processing systems, which let you do batch analytics on a graph, uh, with the graph databases like Neo4j and Titan that, uh, that make these kinds of uh, queries fast. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, I'm, uh, for, like, to address the, the time-varying graphs, the first step is to, is to support efficient updates to RDDs. Um, so the, the issue is that RDDs are, are immutable, which is important for reasons of fault tolerance uh, and, uh, and also uh, correctness. But um, that, that makes it hard to, to support a, a streaming system where you have sort of stateful uh, modifications. Um, so uh, the, the, the first effort towards this is to, uh, to support efficient updates to RDDs using some, some tricks and data structures. And there's actually an open source uh, uh, version of this that you can, you can currently use. And I have some, some much faster um, improvements in the pipeline as well. Okay, so that's it. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. I think if we have time. Thanks. So you mentioned viewing the graph as a stable, transforming, joining, and sending messages. What about viewing the graph as a graph? Is there any? I mean, you had graphs, but those are not from the kind of visualization package. 
Oh, I see, I see. Repeat uh, the question. Sure. Uh, so the question is how to actually visualize a graph. You, 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 it's, it's find a computer on it that you actually want to visualize sometimes, often maybe. Um, so that's a good point. We, we haven't actually done any work on uh, graph visualization. It's, it's a separate area of research to how to visualize these very large graphs. Um, so currently, the, the, the best thing that you can, you can probably do with, with graphs of, that are large enough to be worth using GraphX on is to, to do things like plot statistics of them. So you can plot the degree distribution, for example, or uh, you know, the, the uh, distance distribution. Um, so these, these are things that are, that are kind of made easier by, um, by the combination of using GraphX to get those, those things and then maybe using something, some, you know, after, some visualization package like Databricks maybe uh, to, uh, to, to actually plot those. Oh yeah, so so the, yeah, the, the, there are a number of, of these Repeat open it. source packages. Oh sorry, uh, so the, the Gephi is one of the open source packages for vi visualizing, I believe, uh, graphs. So yeah, we, that, that's a good suggestion. I think we'd be we'd be happy to uh, take some pull requests <laughs> that do that. Regarding like duplication of data. Mm -hmm. So if you have, say, like a relational, what used to be a schema RDD, and you wanted to persist that also to a graph, are you duplicating all of your data into this table graph structure? And should you be sharing a schema between the two or just keeping them separate? I see. So, so if, if I understand the question is, if you have uh, data in, in one form, uh, say as a schema RDD, and you want to lo load it into a graph, uh, there, there's going to be some duplication there. Uh, there is, yes. Yeah. So um, the, the problem is that, that GraphX has its, its own compact representation and, and also second, some indexing on top of that uh, that, it, that it needs to, to put data into. Um, so when you load a, load a graph, you will sort of have an extra copy uh, of, the, of the graph as this, rep, this compressed data. Um, it would, in theory, be, in theory, be possible to not do that, to just operate on, on data in whatever form it is, because GraphX only, only really requires the ability to, um, to load the vertices into a random access, uh, the cache, as I mentioned, and then just scan the edges linearly. Um, so, uh, but yeah, currently you, you have to duplicate. When, for your ETL, can you work with those tables, like populate those tables directly, like in the, the node edge format, or do you need to go through the Graph API? Uh, well, so there's no like uh, support for direct direct access to the graph data structures. You have to go through the, the graph constructor to do that. Uh, but it, it, again, it would be possible to do. There's nothing stopping it. Uh, just this last question, because we're right on time. So if your uh, graph is a tree and you want to find uh, the path between two nodes in a tree, how would you do that? Would you uh, get two subgraphs from two points to the root and somehow find intersection? Huh. So. Um, in, in, so generally finding uh, distances in, in graphs, um, GraphX currently does this using a fairly asymptotically inefficient way, which is just uh, propagating messages kind of naively along the graph structure. So, um, so for, for even for a tree, you would just sort of start, uh, start the message at, at the source and then have it ripple out. And so this is like, it's, you know, it's terrible because it, asymptotically you're, you're consuming, I think it's quadratic um, uh, time in the, in the, the edge size. But, um, for, for large enough graphs, this, this is sort of the only option until we, uh, we have support for the local graphs, which will make this much faster.